Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. It's a great turnout. Uh, my name is Kalua Barnes. I'm actually um, the interim director for Ruck and Parks. And we will spend this afternoon talking about the plans we have for um, the park being put back in place in the coffee park area. For starters, we're going to open up with the mayor. Mayor Corsi is here. Also, we've got Council Member Schwedhelm is here. There he is. You guys know him. And then we've also got someone um, from the Supervisor Gore's office, uh, Jenny Chamberlain, who will actually say a few words. So, Mayor. Thanks, Kalua, and welcome, everybody. It's good to see um, some familiar faces here and some people I don't know. Hello, I'm Chris. Um, you know, over the last 10 months, uh, the whole world has been hearing about Coffee Park, but uh, none of that talk has been about the actual park that it's named after. So today we're gonna start the process of, of how to bring back the park that's the heart of that neighborhood. Um, today, you'll get to share your ideas about what you wanna see in the park, whether it's um, exactly what was there or something different. Uh, We'll talk about uh, the process that uh, we have to go through as city government to, to restore that, to, to do a master plan and a design and actually uh, get to the construction. Um, I have a couple of questions just out of my own curiosity. How many folks are here um, who live or lived in Coffee Park? That's great. And um, how many folks are in the rebuilding process at this point? Okay, so the, these are, you are people who are committed to your neighborhood, and I really appreciate that. Uh, city staff really appreciates that. Our, our staff has, has been working really hard over the last 10 months to try and help you um, get your neighborhood back. This is part of that, and I welcome you all today and look forward to hearing what you have to, to offer as far as ideas about Coffee Park, the park. Who's next? Jenny, Jenny Chamberlain from Supervisor Gore's office. Thank you, Mayor Corsi. Hi, my name is Jenny Chamberlain. I'm the district director for Supervisor James Gore. And although that you are in with the city of Santa Rosa jurisdiction, the city limits, we are your county supervisor. And um, I hope that you all rest assured that Supervisor Gore does work closely with Mayor Corsi and the rest of the city council and everything that we can do to support the city in your rebuilt efforts. And if there's anything that we can do or any other resources that we can help you with outside of what the city can offer, um, please let me know and we'll be more than and happy to do that. I would like to say this is a very important meeting and I'm really proud to partner with the City of Santa Rosa to open the doors for our neighbors to come and really share what they would like for their neighborhood. I mean, a lot of times you have these meetings and 10 people show up and then something happens and a design happens and people say, how come they didn't invite me? This is my park, but this is your home. This is your park. And I'm glad to see everyone here partake and share what you want to envision this park to be. And so I, I thank you for coming. Also, um, we have limited to, Supervisor Gore has purchased a certain amount of tickets to the fair for those who are in need. Um, and first come, first serve basis, but text me at 707-322-5112. Again, at 707-322-5112. Give me your first, your last name what neighborhood you're from, how many adult and how many children tickets you might need. I, I ran out of my first batch. I was um, at the FEMA village this morning passing out water and fair tickets with a group of volunteers that go out there every Saturday. So we passed out about 150 tickets this morning. But um, even though you're in city center was jurisdiction, you're still our constituents and we'd like to extend that offer to all of you. So again, 707-322-5112. I might buy another batch tomorrow or Monday. So um, just let me know and I'll do my best to help you out with that. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Jen Santos. I'm the Deputy Director for Recreation and Parks. And I want to thank you all very much for coming out today. I know it's a nice, beautiful day, uh, but it is air conditioning in here. So hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully that's a, a, a bonus. And I wanted to introduce a couple of people. Uh, one other person, we have the former interim director of Recreation and Parks, Jason Nutt here. There, so he'll be here to help us. And a few other people, your representatives from Coffee Strong. I wanna make sure we get them recognized. 
Hey, I'm Brian Bashan. I'm with <laughs> Coffee Strong. I am heading up the committee for uh, the park rebuild. So I will be your liaison so we get the park that the neighbors want to work with the city. Jen's been great, she's been very listening. She'll be putting out her own survey. It's gonna be online and it's also gonna be on the back table. So make sure you fill that out to get your voices heard to let them know what we want for our park. Thank you. Thank you, and I have a couple more representatives from Coffee Strong. I just want you to introduce yourself so people know, and they, you can offer help later on. Hi, my name is Geraldine Stone. I'm part of the task committee for the Coffee Park, the Park Rebuild. And I'm Michelle Rahm, also on the Coffee Strong board, and heading, well, we're all helping with the park. That was quick. That, that was quick. We're, Lonnie and I are uh, members of Coffee Strong. I'm the vice president of Coffee Strong. And we are, we are here not only representing the uh, Coffee Strong, but also the standing homes. And that's what we take our pride in, in seeing that everybody else gets heard as well. I'm Lonnie Jolliffe. As Bill said, we're the standing homes. Um, Bill just decided to be the vice president. That's huge. Bill also does the entryway. I'm his co-partner for the entryway. I do all the pg e postings that you see all the time. Um, thank you. Um, pg e standing homes, entryway, and any, any questions you ever send me, I'll find the answer. I'm really good at it. Ooh. We have a late arrival. We have. <laughs> I'm not late, I was just in the back. I didn't know we were all supposed to be in the front row. Uh, my name is Jeff O'Krepke. I am the board president of Coffee Strong. And um, like everybody else here, um, we kind of all have our fingers in every single aspect of the rebuild and redevelopment of the park, the entryway, the wall. Um, and so feel free to contact any of us uh, specifically and we'll point you in the right direction for any information that you need or would like to uh, contribute. Thank you. Thank you. So those are your representatives. So later on when you're taking a survey. Oh, yes. One more. I'm so sorry. Yes. Hi. I'm Tara Thompson, the arts coordinator. And I just wanted to acknowledge that we have a representative here today from the Art and Public Places Committee, Katherine Anderson. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. So essentially, we are here to talk about the park specifically and the process that needs to happen before we can get to a rebuild. So if you look at your agenda, if you didn't get an agenda, it's essentially right here. We did our welcomes and introductions. We're gonna talk about the goals of this meeting. We're gonna talk about the master planning process, the coffee park amenities that were there before the fire and things that were damaged because of the fire. We'll talk about the schedule to rebuild, which is also going to include a discussion about funding. And Tara will be talking about our art and coffee, co coffee park. And then we have a questions and answers about the park, the art, any of the processes. And afterwards, we say table discussions, but really there's a survey at the back of the room, and we'd like you to take that today. There's another room, the Cypress Room, just off to the left where you can fill that out and leave it with us before you go today. And of course, conclusions and the next steps. So just by way of kind of giving you some idea, there's the park, there's Coffee Park. It's Pioneer Park. Bicentennial. We usually like to try to show you essentially the other parks that are in the, within the area. Um, the blue circle that you see there is, you, is the area, it's a half mile radius around the neighborhood park. And uh, from a planning perspective, what we usually like to do is invite people within a half mile radius of the park to participate in a redesign. Uh, but we certainly don't want to miss anybody here. And so we've really hyperextended the boundaries to include the coffee park rebuild area entirely, uh, which is, I, I think, um, more than just trying to reach all those folks that are in that area. It makes sense because it really is the only park there for you to enjoy. 
So, th so the goals essentially today are for us to provide you with as much information as we can, answer as many questions, go over that master planning process, and for us to collect your input and thoughts in writing. And then we, uh, the next workshop, at the next workshop we're looking at one in December, is to bring back a plan or versions of a master plan that you can respond to. So today is really about us providing information answering questions and receiving feedback from you in written form. And so the master planning process specifically for Coffee Park is right here. And we're here at the very first one, the meeting, the workshop to talk about uh, what sort of things you'd like to see in the park. Uh, the next uh, thing is to provide a draft master plan graphic at the next meeting for you to respond to and say, did we hear you right? Did we collect the information carefully? Um, and then we're, if any revisions to that, we'll come back with another revised master plan from there. And then we'll have a third and final meeting with the, hopefully the final draft revision of the master plan graphic. Um, however, that process right here can keep going until we get it right but I know we're all in a hurry to get that park rebuilt. So the quicker we can roll up our sleeves and get some work done, the faster we can get to the rebuild. So once the community is satisfied with the plan, then we're gonna take it to the Board of Community Services. This is a council appointed board that represents, that uh, overviews and reviews things from the, for Rec and Parks. Do I have any, I don't think I have any board members here today. Um, so we're going to present it to them. They'll make a recommendation for council to approve or they'll make a recommendation for changes. It's also a public meeting and you can provide any further input you'd like there. And then from there we would go to city council to present it to city council for their approval. And uh, that timeline for the master planning process, we're starting today August 4th. We're looking at finishing in February of 2019. So I mentioned it a little bit before, but additional requests to significantly change the plan will delay that process and further put us out. So that's, basic, that's the basic process, that's the design process that gets us to a point where a engineer, architect, landscape architect can produce a set of construction drawings and we can actually build that park. Here is a, some samples of what uh, this will go before a city council. So here's an example at the very top. Kiwana Springs, it's not quite ready yet, so it's, this is going to go to council very soon. And a place to play master plan is complete. So the, that's essentially what you end up with when you're done with the design, is a graphic that represents the community's desires. So if you go back to before the fire, this, <laughs> this is the plan of Coffee Park prior to the fire. You had two distinct playground areas, a large, lots of turf, a looped pathway. You had picnic areas, monument signs, drinking fountains, and, and generally a nice open area, park feel to it. The current conditions, so what we found out after the fire is that uh, every bit of this park was burned in some way. All of the landscape areas, the irrigation system is a total loss as well as the electrical and the turf. The two playgrounds are structurally damaged. I understand if you're not familiar with looking at them, they may not look like that, but they are disconnected. The parts are disconnected ever so slightly and they are structurally damaged so they will have to be removed and replaced. We have picnic areas that will be replaced. So there might be some picnic furniture that can be reused, but nevertheless, those areas will be replaced. We lost the monument signs. We lost all the park signs. Most of the bollards are damaged beyond use, but some of them might be able to be used. And the pathways are generally in good shape, but there, might, there are some areas where the concrete is something fell across it and was burning. It did degrade the concrete in a few places, but generally they look pretty good. And we do have some trees that were lost as well. And so, sorry to switch this on you, it's sideways. 
Here's Mocha Lane, Dogwood, Coffee Lane, and Amanda Place. So here's the park, the big turf area. And the black dots on here are the trees that we know for sure are gonna have to be removed. And the green dots are trees that um, maybe need some pruning and could most likely remain. This is draft right now, but we wanna try to show you everything we have. And depending on what sort of decisions are made on the design and the amenities you'd like, we may remove some and replace, and obviously we'd be replacing all of the burn trees. And this is draft, but it, it's um, a much better scenario than uh, what I had originally thought upon visiting right after the fire. So essentially, uh, I have a lot of questions. Well, what are you going to rebuild? And so the intent is to rebuild what was there, of, of course. And so what was there was two playgrounds, a picnic area, turf, signs. By infrastructure, I mean um, irrigation and electrical services, trees and landscape areas. And one significant thing to think about as you're taking your surveys and going through it is that um, playgrounds usually are not separated in today's world. So when we put the playgrounds back, we will connect them. We will find a spot for both of them to be located near each other or adjacent to each other or part of, this, part of the whole entire process. Um, it was kind of an old, an old way of doing things to put playgrounds separate and you think you'd have um, more um, space and running in between them, but now we want to put them together. So we've been, you've heard from your Coffee Strong representatives. The city's been meeting with Coffee Strong. They've, you guys have put together your own survey. And so here are, here are the survey results from that. Obviously, everyone wants playground structures. So I underlined it because that is the only thing that is on the list above. <laughs> so obviously, we're definitely going to do that. We want to replace those playground structures. Uh, the remaining things are in addition to what was already there and being requested. So we've had a request for portable restrooms, a dog park, additional picnic areas, commemorative benches, a community garden, shade structures over the picnic areas and playgrounds, uh, basketball and half court, handball, additional trash, additional drinking fountains, lighting, buildings, and art. So I just want to clarify for you today that those, those are all really good ideas. And we're here, if you want to say it again, please put that on the survey. You need to be able to say whatever you want to see in the park as far as an amenity. And when I say amenity, these are the things I mean. Picnic areas, benches, whatever you could think of that would go into a park is called an amenity. Um, the, the handball is not necessarily something, it didn't look like it scored that well from the survey, um, but if it's, some, it's something that was important to you, please put it back on the survey, but it's not necessarily anything we'd be looking at. Uh, in a basketball, a half court, you'll see on the survey, not a full court. So if this is something the community desires, a half court would be preferable uh, for a neighborhood park. If we usually put full courts in a community park where somebody could drive to that and spend a full game time there. This is more of a walk from your house kind of park, a small neighborhood park. So a half court is typically what you'd see in there. Um, shade structures, those are all good. Commemorative benches, I'm going to kind of include those with um, Tara's presentation. If they don't make it as part of that process, those are definitely things we can consider. And of course, definitely the trash and drinking fountains, no problem. Lighting is going to be an additional request that we'd have to look at. It's not something we would normally do except for security. Uh, and um, buildings are things you definitely don't see in neighborhood parks. That doesn't mean they're not supposed to be there. It's usually we're, we're limited, you know, you've got about 5.5 acres. It's a small park and we like to keep the sight lines all the way through the park and putting buildings in there does kind of prevent us from having that. And of course, we're gonna have a whole section on art, so we're looking at including art. So that's what we collected from Coffee Strong. We will be including those comments along with the comments we receive from you today as part of the overall comments we're gonna receive going forward. So rebuilding, so now let's uh, pretend we are in February and the master plan is complete. 
We are going to start the removal of debris from the park potentially this fall, but I have some good news. We have preliminary information on the soils report we conducted at the park because we were concerned about whether there were any hazards there that might have been unknown. And the preliminary findings from that are that there are no hazards in the park. So we're only, yes, that's clap worthy. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> So the only debris we're looking at removing is actual debris. We're not looking at removing hazardous debris. And so the reason we were looking at getting started this fall is because hazardous debris takes a long time there. It needs to be tested and retested and piled and um, taken to certain special sites. It's a long process. The process to remove the glass and shards and th different things that might be there is gonna be a lot smaller. So we're probably looking at starting in spring right before the actual rebuild of the park so that we don't have a site that's just mud all over the winter. From an environmental standpoint, that's a, that's a tough thing to do. We have to do lots of implementation if we do uh, remove the debris. Uh, right now we have some turf there, which is binding the soil. It's keeping it from running off into the drain. If you haven't run out into the middle of the park, there's a huge drain out there and everything drains to it. So we really want to preserve what's there. The only reason we might move the debris early is um, if, it, if it makes sense, if this process is moving forward. But there is an October deadline. You can't do any massive grading after October or before April 14th. So we're looking at starting after April 14th. And then um, obviously we'd begin construction plans. And although we're going to be starting construction plans in February of 2019, we're going to start the process to hire somebody to do that long before that. And they could even get a little head start on some of the basic stuff. So we really want to get that pushed as far forward as possible. And we want the um, architect, landscape architect, engineer to be able to complete the plans, the construction plans, by summer, the next summer, essentially, 2019. And then we're just going to start the construction bidding, looking for a construction company to actually do re the rebuild in the park. And then we're going to start in fall with all the grading complete by October and hopefully have everything in by winter open to the public. We may decide if it's rainy, it's a super rainy win winter to reopen the grand opening in 2020, but it, we are trying to get the park open by winter of 2019. And I know this looks like a really long schedule. If you think back on those master plan samples I showed you, those have taken three years just to get to that point. So this is an extremely aggressive timeline for something like this. And I know it's going to mean a lot of work on you to come to the meetings and roll up your sleeves and do the work and put the information in so we can get moving on this. It is an aggressive schedule. It is doable as long as we stick to this schedule. And then we're looking at, yeah, opening in winter 2019 with maybe a more celebratory spring great grand opening. So funding for that. Question? My question is, is, is the debris removal and cleanup going to be done by city forces or are we going to contract out? We would contract that out. So for funding, I'm trying not to make this complicated, but if anybody's worked with FEMA, it just is. <laughs> so I know. <laughs> Nobody from FEMA is here right now. Just kidding. Um, FEMA Category A will refund the city 90% of the funds it spends to remove the debris. So uh, we have, uh, when we do go to remove the debris, they would theoretically refund the city up to 90%. Cal OES comes in behind that to provide another 6%. So we're looking at city funds needed to do that around 4%. And so FEMA category G, that's kind of the other category, parks and different things they don't know that don't fit into their normal engineering categories, funds 75% of reimbursable expenses, and then Cal OES comes in behind that and ref, uh, funds 75% of the gap, leaving the city with about 6.25% of the cost to 
rebuild the site. And I just put this on here so you have it. <laughs> we do have a $300,000 uh, $300, um, insurance, but that's for the entire city. That's not just for this park. We had 10 parks damaged overall, and this is gonna need to be split by all of them. So the gap for funding of things we're gonna receive from FEMA and Cal OES is pretty significant. Uh, we're looking at the cost to rebuild around $5 million, and the, how we came up with that number is a good industry standard when you don't have a lot of detailed information is to take around a $1 million an acre. And so we know the entire park was damaged, but the degree of damage may not take us to around six acres. So we're looking at around five acres to rebuild, and that's usually a million dollars an acre for $5 million. So it's not a super refined estimate, but it's a rough estimate so we can have some guideline on our target. When we get a design in hand, then we can get an actual estimate and hopefully we'll have a lower number, but that's usually a pretty good industry standard. The FEMA, so if you look above at what FEMA is gonna recover for this park outside of the debris removal, just the recovery part, they're really only looking at funding the rebuild around a million dollars if everything works out right. And the reason that is is because FEMA does not consider turf a reimbursable expense, and Coffee Park was a lot of turf. It was a really pretty park. So uh, we're looking at trying to uh, fill that gap, fund, fund that gap of about $4 million. And so we are working with the Santa Rosa Parks Foundation, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, to try to fill that gap. We have the potential to look for grants, and we also have the potential to use park development fees in some cases for straight uh, new items. Park development fees are collected from developers when they come in to build a new subdivision in order to provide that subdivision with a park. It's not necessarily meant to rebuild, uh, but when we're looking at new construction and new things, there is some flexibility. But I wanted to see if Christy could talk about the Santa Rosa Parks Foundation, because they've been doing a great job helping us fundraise. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Christy Bufo. I'm the Marketing and Outreach Coordinator for Recreation and Parks. And um, yes, the president of the Santa Rosa Parks Foundation is on vacation. He wanted to be here, so I agreed that I would just share a little bit about the work that they're doing. Um, the Parks Foundation is a, a nonprofit organization, and um, they have a mission really to uh, assist uh, Santa Rosa City Parks. Uh, they played um, an instrumental role in um, raising all the funds to buy the new engine for the train out at Howarth Park. And um, after the fires, they stepped up to be the key fundraiser to help us uh, restore our fire damaged parks, not just Coffee Park, all of the parks. And so that's a, a sizable goal um, with four million just for Coffee Park. So um, they've gotten to work on it. We, we just uh, got a pretty good sized check from the um, Iron Man Foundation um, for $15,000 donation and then we will also be getting some proceeds from um, uh, all of the registrations for the Community 5K. So that's good news. Um, but there's a long way to go. So um, they're looking for donations, obviously. If you have any of your contractors that might be interested in, in pitching in, that would be great. And the best place to find information is at SantaRosaParksFoundation.org. And um, the Parks Foundation is also looking for board members. So anybody that has a, you know, a passion for parks and fundraising, um, send them to the Santa Rosa Parks Foundation. Thanks, Christy. Do that way better than me. And then I want to bring up Tara Thompson, our arts coordinator for the city, to talk about art and coffee park. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Tara. Um, I coordinate the city's public art program. We have uh, a collection of over 200 items all throughout the city that I'm responsible for taking care of. We also commission new projects on an annual basis. I'm the staff person for the Art and Public Places Committee. Um, they're a council-appointed committee that make decisions about public art in Santa Rosa. 
Um, I'm here today to talk about if there's a strong desire to see public art incorporated into the design of Coffee Park, what that might look like. I know on the survey that Coffee Strong did, there was an indication that that was something people were interested in. So um, if that is the case today with, with you that are here and everyone who ends up taking the survey, please indicate that on the survey. There are a few questions related to the art uh, in the park on the survey. So today, um, I really just wanted to talk about what public art is and what a process might look like for commissioning art in Coffee Park. Public art really is just what it sounds like. It's art in public spaces. Um, sometimes they're designed specifically for the site that they're in. They encourage people to see the site in a different way, to interact with it in a different way. Sometimes they have some component of interpreting history or place, um, perhaps addressing a social or environmental issue. Um, public art very, very often is, is created in very uh, deep collaboration with the community, with, um, with neighbors, with people who live in the area where it is installed. Um, they, th those pieces can reflect the ideas and the values of, of those um, participants of that community. Uh, free, obviously public art is meant to be free and accessible to all, and so that's why it is in public spaces. Um, and examples of the type of art public art usually um, includes murals, sculpture, commemorative art, integrated landscape architectural works, community art, and functional art. Functional art could be a bench or a shade structure or even a play structure. So a typical process for commissioning public art, this is the process we use for most projects that go through the Art in Public Places Committee. Um, the, I already kind of talked a little bit about the committee itself, but they are the, the body, the city entity that makes these decisions. And so when we start a project, we're really looking at, okay, how are we going to ask, our, ask artists if they want to be involved with this project? That's artist solicitation. We're sending out an invitation to artists to participate. And it's a competitive process. So because we're working with public funds and we're a public entity, we want to make sure that we're giving people an opportunity, artists, an opportunity to respond to our call for artists. And then we have a selection process established, which can include representatives from this community, from this neighborhood. Um, some of you here might end up on a selection panel. It's a very collaborative process. It includes members of the Art Public Places Committee as well as community members and other arts-related um, members of the community. Uh, once the project, once an artist is identified, then we really can start with the project development. So in this case, I would really recommend that an artist work directly with you. An artist is selected, but not an artwork per se, and then the artist works directly with this community, with this neighborhood, um, to develop ideas for what the art could be in the park. So that gives you an opportunity to provide direct input to the artist. It doesn't have to go through an extra step of, of, the pro of a city process. Um, then there's always Art and Public Places Committee approval. As I said, they are the body that has the authority to approve an artist and approve an, old, an, an end artwork that is decided. Then we would contract with the artist. We would work with them to make sure that all of the scope of work we're asking them to do is identified in the, in the agreement and there's appropriate budget for that. And of course, neighborhood participation really is throughout the process. Like I said, we really want that to be a part of the artist selection process, the art, art development process, and, and then once it's implemented as well, how that piece gets installed and it continues its life now that it's installed in Coffee Park. Um, there's a couple options for how <clears throat> uh, in the process, when in the process, the art itself is designed. There's, there's not one right way to do it, although I think there might be um, kind of a smarter way to do it in this case for this project. But one option would be to have the art designed before the park is designed. And a couple things to know about that is it would significantly delay the rebuilding process because you're really asking an artist to do that piece of it first before you continue with the, ma with the master planning and the park design. It's kind of like if you have an idea for the interior design of your project, you would do that first and then you build the house around it. It's kind of an analogy to what we would be talking about in that case. Um, 
the, the kind of interesting part about doing a project like that is it does allow the artist the freedom to design a very wide range of possible projects that could include integrated design elements such as pathways, play structures, or amphitheaters. Those are examples from other projects. Oops. Of course, I'm the one that messes it up. Um, another option is to have the artwork, oh no, sorry folks, is they have the artwork designed after the art, uh, sorry, after the park is designed. So it's almost the complete opposite of what I just described. And a situation like that would basically, uh, there'd be no delay to the, to the park building process, um, but it would limit the possible projects that an artist could come up with. Um, because they would need to be standalone items that could be placed in the existing park once it's designed and built. So a sculpture, perhaps, that could just be plunked down. So the third option, which I think would be really successful in this case, would be to have um, the art designed concurrently with the park design, where the artist is actually a, team, a member of the design team because then there's a real symbiotic relationship between the artist and the designer, and they can share ideas and figure out the best way to have that artwork be integrated into the park design. Again, that would be no delay to the building process. It would be right along with the schedule that we've been talking about here today. And then lastly, I just want to mention funding, because that's a huge issue when we're doing a big project like this. For artwork, we do have a separate fund called the Public Art Fund. It's not a part of the city's general fund. And so we have funds available above and beyond what we're going to be looking for for the rebuild of the park. So the Art and Public Places Committee has an annual planning process where each year they look at what possible projects are out there and they decide how they want to allocate funds. That would be the case for this if a project is going to go forward in the park. I would bring to them the possibility of having this be the project that's funded for that, for that plan, um, for that annual plan, and then they can allocate appropriate funds to that depending on what we have available at that time. Most of our funding in the Public Art Fund comes from private development fees. So there's a 1% for art requirement here in Santa Rosa for commercial only development, and so that's where we get most of our funding. We also have a, a, a goal of funding art in public, in public art in parks specifically. So that's one of the um, kind of main pieces of our master plan that we would be implementing and fulfilling if we were to, to do a project in Coffee Park. We also would be looking for possible grant funding to expand what we're able to do as well. And again, um, the survey that you'll fill out at the end of the day will have some questions about art. So please respond with your thoughts. Let, let me know, let us know what your, what your thinking is. We also are asking on that survey, I didn't talk about it too much. I mentioned that it's a, it's a type of art that you see, but we are asking if you have thoughts about whether the art should be commemorative of the wildfires in some way as well. So please respond, write any questions. My business cards are out on that table. So if you have specific questions for me um, that can't be answered today, please get in touch with me. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. I appreciate it. And um, we are going to get to some questions and answers, but I just want to skip ahead. So if any of you need to leave for any reason, we have this information for you about what to do afterwards. So to, just to go over some of the specifics about the survey, there is a paper form for you to fill out today if you'd like. Or you can take it with you and mail it back to us at that address. All of this information is on the agenda. There are a lot of agendas outside if you'd like to take that. Um, or as mentioned before, this, this is being filmed today. It's being videoed. So the video is going to be online at the srcity.org backslash coffee project. And you can take the survey there. So if you, for whatever reason, can't do that today, you can go online and do it there. We would just ask that if you f just fill out one, one survey, or if you do change your mind or want to add, if you could tell us that in the written comments. And in the written comments section, there's a place for you to ask questions. So if you think of a question later on and you put it in that um, written comment section, we will come back with an answer at the next meeting for you. 
And uh, the, if we can get all of the surveys back by November 16th, then we can include that information for the design going forward at the next meeting on December 8th. And the video is going to be available on the 8th, we believe, online at the srcity.org coffee project. And the survey is there as well. And um, we are looking to collect the survey by November 16th. So one of those three ways you can do that. We also have a room, just a reminder, out to the left here, uh, with tables, chairs, papers, pens, staplers, et cetera, where you can fill out your form here if you like. There's a box in the back, a cardboard box that says place your surveys here. So if you are able to stay and fill out the survey, just place that in there before you go or find a staff member. And then just kind of a brief reminder about um, the next steps. And then I'm going to back up to questions and answers. So our next meeting is planned for December 8th. 2 to 4 p.m. right here. We may change the location of the room, but generally we're planning to have it right here. If we do decide to change anything, we really need you to check at that srcity.org coffee project. And we'll also be working with Coffee Strong to update. And we'll be emailing any changes. We want to make sure we have your email address before you leave today. So the next meeting, like I mentioned last time, we'll present the draft master plan or a version of, versions of that for you to respond to. And then we're um, looking at a final meeting in January, which we don't have a date yet, but we'll be looking in January to have that final meeting. And then I just wanted to remind you that we're not the only folks distributing information about the recovery effort. We are here today specifically about the park and art in the park, uh, but there's also lots of other places that have information. And here's three of the most, the ones that I know for sure. <laughs> the one on the top, srcity.org, Coffee Project, that's where you're gonna find information about the park and art in the park, this project specifically. There's also the official website, sonomacountyrecovers.org, for any information you might have not related to the park. And you also have the Resilient City Permit Center for rebuilding information. And you guys probably already all know this, but just in case, I wanted to have that there for you. So uh, before you leave today, make sure you fill out the survey or at least um, fill it out and bring it back to us. Oh, one other thing. I just wanted to quickly re uh, reiterate that the video from today will be available um, as of Wednesday, and the updates to the um, srcity.org slash coffee project will be available. Um, I'm going to try to do it right after this meeting, but definitely by Monday. Okay. Thank you. I knew I was going to forget something. <laughs> so I know we've covered a lot of information today, so I, we wanted to leave um, a good amount of time for questions, and it looks like we've got plenty of time. We want to leave at least 15 minutes for you to fill out the survey if you'd like to do it today. We will do our best to answer every question we have. So Jen, if you could clarify us on the issue of funding, whether the shortfall is directly related to the turf or other things in terms of FEMA's contribution. Sure. So we, we do have a small amount of uh, area that FEMA is just not going to fund, no matter what. That small percentage. And in addition to that, it is mainly the turf. The irrigation, the, um, uh, let's see, the electrical, all the structural elements, the playgrounds, the picnic areas, everything else will be funded by FEMA. It's just essentially the large turf areas, uh, landscape areas, those areas that aren't don't have any structure to them, are not supported by FEMA reimbursement generally. We are asking. We have asked. So, and we are still waiting for a response. Is that right? Yeah. So, we will see. We are uh, not going to stop asking <laughs> um, until, they, until we can't anymore. We're asking for reimbursement for the turf. We hope to get it because it is such a large component of this, of this area. And uh, in a park, it's different. maybe a little bit different than your backyard. There's several engineered layers under it with drainage rock and lots of things going on. Um, so it's not just a seed out thrown out there. It's, it's structure, there's some structure to it. So we're trying to um, 
help FEMA understand the full cost of that, that there is, some st there is structural element to the turf and we hope to get their reimbursement. But meanwhile, we, we don't want to assume that we would get that, so we're, we've subtracted that out. That's why there's such a huge $4 million gap. So that $1 million includes the things that they would fund uh, that is damaged, like the playground structures, the infrastructure to the park, pathways, which most of the pathways are fine. So hope that helps that. So uh, my name is Lenny Breeze. I lived across the street from the park. And uh, so I'm kind of assuming here that the turf is all has to go. I really haven't heard that per se, but that's the understanding I'm, that we're going to have to tear off all the turf. Is there a chance that this could be labeled a play field or a, a way to incorporate that as a need for replacement? So my understanding is there, there is going to need to be most of the turf removed, just a small bit, in order to sift, get the de debris sifted out. Uh, because in my um, experience, right after the park, walking through it, there was quite a bit of glass and metal parts and parts from people's houses and things. So we really want to make sure we get that cleaned up. I, there may be some areas where we can leave certain bits of the turf, but I think really most of it's going to have to be... Uh, replaced and therefore some of it removed in order to get us new turf that is safe uh, for people to play in. Did I answer all that? I think I missed a part. Yes, kind of. I guess it just seems very extensive to a certain extent and I can understand uh, the issue. Uh, it certainly would be an issue if there's hazardous materials in there and I know we had some issues with glass and turf and in uh, artificial turf even so it's kind of a, something that can happen. But I'm just thinking that the park would be nice to get back to some usable state. And I don't know, is there an opportunity to do some of the debris removal up front so that we can, people can walk on the pass and use the park to an extent? Uh, there, there could be, but we are, we are looking, I think one thing I forgot to mention, we are looking at putting up fences when we start the construction, because if you've gone by the park recently, there's a lot of dumping going on at the park. There's a lot of people putting debris in the park um, so they don't have to remove it themselves necessarily. I'm not really sure why this is happening, uh, but we're trying to secure the site. But theoretically, it could happen, but we're, um, we want to be sure to protect the site um, from that. And uh, it is going to be under construction relatively soon, in the next year. Um, so we're looking at fencing it. Otherwise, um, we wouldn't really want to open it until we're absolutely sure it's safe for folks. And although we're, I'm super happy that there's no hazards, there are still actual debris hazards. It's just not hazardous soil. So in order for, us, for me to feel safe providing that space for kids and dogs and things like that, I really want to make sure that all of the debris is removed. So it's, uh, it's going to take a while. And again, if we remove it now, it would sit over winter at pretty muddy site, so the best option is for us to wait if, if it doesn't become hazardous. We start waiting for the final, um, the final uh, map, but the initial study from the um, soils testing is, is looking really great. I hope that helps. Let's see, any other questions? Oh, yes. When all the debris was removed, a big pile of it was left in the corner of Coffee Park. Why wasn't that taken away along with everything else? I, I think that that part, I'm really not sure. I, I really have no idea why the, the, car, the car parts are there. We did initially um, allow folks to um, stack some cars there. Uh, we had an agreement with somebody to remove street cars, and so we placed them there before they went on a truck. Uh, but the, when I went back out to the park, suddenly there's more parts there. So we're not really sure why. I, I don't know if you have a better answer, Jason. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to speak loud. Um, so, uh, so yeah, to, uh, what, what ended up happening is FEMA actually doesn't do, they don't do debris removal on public properties unless there's a public structure there. And so the park properties that we had that were damaged or the open space properties, FEMA's program didn't actually include those. And so even though there may have been things like car parts and cars and other debris that fell into those areas, um, they wouldn't allow us to be participate in that program for removal of those products. We have to do it separately as a property owner. Um, the, only part pro the only properties they 
participated in were the two fire stations uh, up in Fountain Grove because we had structures on there and they allowed us to opt in for those particular places. So uh, hopefully that answers the question about why those are there. Um, we would like to find some way of removing some of those hazards. Uh, the fencing that's likely going to go up here fairly soon um, is, is the first attempt. Um, one of the things that Jen um, uh, didn't mention, we, we may be looking at uh, possibly phasing the debris removal, um, which could allow us to shrink the area that we would exclude folks. But as Jen said, our, some of the biggest concern um, is really having additional debris deposited on that piece of property as more and more properties rebuild. We, we, we really don't want to be in this ongoing process like, some, like, like um, we've been seeing. So. Thanks, Jason. He's been more intimately involved in some of those things, so. Thanks. We, we are using the microphones because those who can't attend today, we want to make sure everyone can hear. Uh, my name is Debbie Bratberg, and I have to say, if my house is going to burn down, I'm very honored to be part of Coffee Strong because it's been an amazing group, what this group has done to help us all, and I just want to say I appreciate that. Um, I also wanted to um, say, because I live across the street from the park, this is very near and dear to me. And although um, I know Brian and I don't always agree on everything, I just want to say I very much respect your leadership coming forward and, and helping us also to get this process going. So thank you for that. And uh, now that I've said that, I want to just let Park and Rec people know, and you might be aware that when the survey came out, um, there was a lot of good discussion on the Facebook, the Park at Coffee Park, but one thing that seemed clear to me is there, there might be um, a different opinion on some things, a different perspective depending on whether you border the park and whether you do not border the park. So I just wanted to say, if you would keep that in mind, and because it is important to me and I'm, I'm like saying it publicly, I would say, I would be willing um, and would like to, if there is still room for being part of the process of the park at Coffee Park as far as the planning, so someone that borders the park is part of the process too. So thank you. Thanks, I appreciate that. And of course, if you're interested in participating in a more detailed way, do let us know afterwards. Hi, my name is Sylvia Blue Elsie. My husband and I are also park perimeter owners and are rebuilding. Um, one thing I just want the city, parks and rec, as well as the city to know, even though you've got those orange fabricated fences, if you will, um, there's still a lot of activity that is going on beyond those borders. Um, we have been relocated not too far from where we did live and I drive through the neighborhood often and there are people that go and sit in the park area and I've seen people that have taken in lunches, they're picnicking, they're using the playground. And if those structures are not sound like it sounded like you had made mention, um, that's, that's really dangerous for those kids and, and I think those should be put down immediately. I think those structures should be removed. So, um, although we're not using it, there are other people that aren't aware of that that are. So, and again, being on the perimeter, we're hoping just to have the park as it was. There's a lot of thought that has gone into what we should have and what people want, and we're concerned about how that will affect what we had before, and we really want what we had beforehand. So, hopefully that'll go into consideration moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, I appreciate that. And I hope the fences, I've seen the same thing, people picnicking in there, et cetera. Hopefully the fences will help folks understand it's not open yet. We're gonna get there as soon as we can. Like Jason said, we might be able to open certain parts of it if we feel like that is something we can do. I, I'd just like to give a little bit of information before we go too much farther. I'm Bill Dodson and I'm a member of the uh, Rotary Club of Santa Rosa West. And after the, shortly after the fire, uh, we had our major fundraiser and uh, 
we asked ourselves what did we want to do in uh, light of what had just recently happened. And an idea, idea came up that wouldn't it be nice to do some kind of a children's imagination village in Coffee Park. And uh, that circulated through the five clubs in downtown Santa Rosa, and they all jumped on and said, we want to be part of that too, which means they will raise funds for that as well. We don't know what that will be. I have talked to Jen about this before. Uh, we would do it uh, with the city's blessings and with the neighborhood's blessings. What we can bring to it, besides some money, is uh, hands-on uh, workers. We're good at getting uh, uh, companies and suppliers to provide materials and labor to help us and we've done a lot of projects in the community in the past so we have certain ways we can uh, work to do that just so people can keep that in mind if they want to add that to their wish list. So my question is, how will the city uh, parks department, I'll be a little bit more direct, um, in the more content, uh, for the more contentious issues, um, the number one I think everyone can agree would be bathrooms, whether there is any temporary or permanent bathrooms, how will the city determine, not just those, but anything else that gets added to even the art, whatever, is that like a majority rules, is that like 85 super majority, you know, how are you going to define that? This is always the most very uh, most asked question at every public meeting I uh, perform for these for the parks, and it's not a voting system. We generally look at the uh, at the things that people favor most and the things that are reasonable for the park. So one thing I glazed over, and I can kind of go back to it a little bit, that uh, we have two types of parks in the city. We have a community park and we have a neighborhood park. And a community park is something we expect people to drive to. We expect you to spend hours and hours, hopefully all day there. <laughs> and uh, there's lots of, there's sometimes community centers like here, there's buildings, there's restrooms, there's court, court, port courts and um, huge playgrounds, pools. Neighborhood parks are, are meant for the neighbors, and so we typically see smaller things in them. So we look at things that are reasonable. So that's one reason why we mentioned that the buildings aren't most likely going to be located in the park because it's something we wouldn't normally see, including a restroom building. So if restrooms are desired by the community, we look at that as an option to provide a portable restroom there if that's something that's desired by the community. But we look at generally what does everybody want, what can be reasonably fit into the park. There is the possibility that if uh, something beyond what is already there is desired by the community and it becomes part of the master plan, it may become a phased project where that portion is done when we have the funding to do it. Uh, beyond what we have right now. So there is that possibility. So if we get to a point where people are asking for so much stuff, we just f can't possibly fund it all. We do have master plans that exist right now where only portions of them are built because that's all the funding the city has. So the intent is to replace what was there and to also bring those two playgrounds together. And we certainly can support uh, whatever the community desires from an, from an overall, what do people generally like? Hope that helps. The city council makes the final call. <laughs> we're really looking f for input from you. And then we're just conduits. We're, we provide that and we bring that to council. Uh, for instance, on Kiwana Springs that you saw recently, um, there were plenty of people that didn't agree with everything that was there, but that was generally what people wanted. That's Those are the things that we could do there, that's a community park, and um, we leave the tough decisions for the council about, but it, we really try to make sure we've heard everybody and provided a plan that can do everything that is possible in there within reason, uh, and then present that plan, a very balanced plan to council. Um, so really, it's your city council and it's your elected officials who are making the final decision, but it's really you who are telling us what you want in your park. We're really here just to listen, and make sure we hear everything that you have to say and take down everything that you would want, if that helps. Oh, now I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> Not at all. Um, you know, the, the idea is to try and find some consensus for the people who are gonna use the park. 
Um, that's why we have this meeting. That's why we have the master planning process. Uh, our, our staff works hard to help you come to an agreement about what you want in the park. The city council doesn't want to be making decisions that are, that are, you know, this side wants this, this side wants this. We say yes, and you hate us, and we say no, and you hate us. Um, so, so th I mean, that's, that's what we end up having to do sometimes. But the idea is for you to come to a consensus as a neighborhood on what you want there. So um, please, do that. <laughs> Much more eloquently said, and also that is why we have tables for you, so that you can interact with your neighbors, you can have those discussions, well, why don't we want that, but I want that, and you can really engage with each other and have that time and moment, because it's, it's definitely not up to us, we really want, as the mayor said, all of you to make those decisions for us. Oh. Hi, uh, I'm John Elsey, and I am also a, a uh, perimeter resident and I just it's really important that um, that I point out that there's people who use the park and there's people who live on the park and have to deal with the park uh, each and every day so it's really important that uh, we incorporate you know everybody's uh, ideas and wishes but uh, obviously the people that live on the, the perimeter of the park have a highly vested interest to, to what Jeff said as to you know exactly what's coming in and exactly where it's going. So I hope that um, is taken into consideration. Thanks. One over here. Actually, this gentleman had his hand up for a while. My name is Paul Ortlinghouse. Thank you for the meeting today. Uh, we live on Walnut Creek Drive, so we're just 0.2 miles from the perimeter and a standing home. Um, and we love seeing all the construction and we're so glad our neighborhood is coming back. Uh, we've lived where we do 15 years and I've been raising four kids with my wife and it's been our park. We walk there, we ride our bikes there. Uh, so we are vested in it uh, from that vantage point and I still have an eight year old uh, that, and an 11 and 12 year old that we will be using the park for lots and lots of time. And so having said that, even though we're not perimeter neighbors exactly, um, I get concerned when, you know, there's all these ways to give feedback, especially the online. Like, at what point, and I appreciated your map at the beginning, do you limit who gets input? Because even though it is a neighborhood park, we know just from seeing it, a lot of people do drive to the park and use it because it was a great neighborhood park. So I'm hoping there's a way, and I don't know if this is politically correct, but that folks that don't live in the neighborhood don't get as much weight in voting for what and giving input, does that make sense? Like, so I noticed you asked for our addresses. So as we fill out surveys and, and do that, is there some sense of weeding out, you know, people that aren't part of the neighborhood? So you're correct on the surveys, especially online, et cetera, you won't be able to fill out the survey until you give us your name and address and how many adults and stuff. And we're, we're gonna report back to you the survey results. So we're gonna say the survey results are coming from folks reporting within that zone and here's some folks who didn't, if we have that. But we're gonna report back to you what we find. Uh, the invitation went out to everybody that was in that um, purple line uh, to come here. So we hope that folks, I haven't really seen anybody outside of Coffee Park overly interested in providing specific comments, but we'll, come, we'll keep an eye on it, but we're really looking to um, just give you some feedback on who participated at the next meeting. Thanks, uh, my name is Kathy Harris. I'm the new principal of Schaefer Elementary School, and we are very excited about involving our students in this pro process. I've met with Jen, and the timeline matches our school timeline really well, so we appreciate that. So we'll be working on making sure that the student voices are heard as well. Um, I'm here with a, a third grade teacher, Tracy Henry, so she's gonna help me bring this back to our staff and our students, and thank you for this process. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I am looking forward to the students' participation. 
Hi, my name is uh, Adam Hill. Uh, don't live actually right on the park. Uh, first perimeter might actually be on the very farther end. We were the second to last house to go on Brandy Lane down towards Barnes. Uh, but I just wanted to give uh, all additional perspective from people who are farther away who also work, walk to the park regularly that you know we don't want to have all these extra structures and all these extra, you don't want to have restroom facilities, you don't want to have uh, so much stuff added to the park to pull away from the natural beauty that we had of the neighborhood park the way it was. I and mean, that's one of the reasons we bought the house when we moved into the area seven years ago, is because it was a nice, beautiful neighborhood park that didn't have uh, stuff drawing people in from, from all over the city and made it nice and, and give it a, a nice community feel to the park. So I just kind of wanted to give that perspective that there are, I know there are people who want to add you know, everything in the kitchen sink as well, maybe literally at the park so they can wash their dishes after their barbecue. Uh, but there's also people who want to just keep it the way that it was. So. If I could jump in, oh, geez, so loud. If I could jump in real quick. Please, thank you for sharing um, all of this, and please be sure to include it on your surveys. There is a portion at the end where you can write in, so please write away. Yes, I, I really appreciate that's one thing I, I do tend to forget. Uh, please write it in, because we are going to look at all the comments that we receive as a way of collecting the input today, not necessarily your questions. So if you, can, if you can't stay today to do that, please fill it out and get it back to us or do the online survey. Another question? I'm Abby Damron. We live on Mocha Lane, right across from the little park. There's little park, big park. Um, and so when we moved in three years ago, literally every time we went outside, can we go to the park? No, we're going to the grocery store. Can we go to the park? No, we're going to pick up such and such. You know, like every time we went outside, we went, that's right, the park is right there. Um, so we're not going to be done rebuilding for probably another year, but I know it's going to be really hard for my kids to see that park not ready, you know, for us. Um, but I just, I just want to say that, you know, as a mom with young kids, it was hard to have a park without a bathroom, you know, because then I had to take them home or to a tree or whatever. But as a person who lives there and will have to deal with whatever crime comes with that restroom, I really don't want a restroom there. Um, and, you know, the fact that my kids are going to walk outside and see whatever art is presented there that's fire related, I really don't want the park to trigger my kids. I want them to go to that park and be like, yay, we're going to play, we're going to run around, we're going to kick our ball, or whatever. And I don't want them to go to that, look at that park and say, oh, that's right, the fire. You know, I, I really want the park to be a place of joy for them and a place of fun and a place that our, that our neighborhood uses and, and not something that makes them afraid. Hi, I'm Darby, and um, I live right across from the park also. And um, when I bought my house 24 years ago, um, the reason that I bought that house was because it was a neighborhood park. If there were bathrooms in that park, basketball courts in that park, I would not have bought my house there. And I don't feel like I should be forced now to have bathrooms, basketball courts, and stuff because my house burned down. So please take into consideration the people that live around that park. The people that live around that park are the people that were over there every single day picking up trash. They are the people that kept that park the way that that park was. And so when you guys enjoy that park, remember that it's the neighbors that live around that park that have investments in that park, as well as everybody else around there. But please do not bring all that stuff into our neighborhood. We're looking for a question, if you have a question at the end of your comment, because we do want to collect your comments in writing. Although we appreciate hearing it, we, do, we are looking to make sure we I get have all your a, questions. I have a comment, not a question. May I do it? May I say it? Of course. Okay. I've lived in Coffee Park since before the actual park was built, and have had, I've been, spent many hours in that park, and I want to say one thing in favor of a, a portable bathroom inside an enclosed structure. The YMCA used to have a day camp there in the summers, and my daughters were counselors there, and they put a portable bathroom there right over by the small kids' um, uh, playground by the drinking fountain, and I don't think it caused any problems. It was a simple thing. We went to, when we were in Bend, Oregon, otherwise when I'm there with my kids and my little kids, guess where they go? In the bushes. Yeah. 
because it's too far to walk back home for a two-year-old or a three-year-old. Okay. So we are looking for questions. If you have another question, any other questions? Comments, please save them for the comment cards. Question. Thank you. So my question regarding whatever facility for us relieving ourselves is, whether it be a two-year-old or an adult, who's going to maintain those? Because as she mentioned, yes, there were porta potties several summers, and they finally removed them permanently. And the reason for that was because we called because of vandalism. We called because they were tipped over. They were set on fire. And they were even structures that were pretty solid. We're talking a small wood structure next to them that were, they were a mess and the smell was horrible. So who's going to maintain those if they are placed there? So if portable restrooms are placed in the park, we have a contract service that will come and service them. And the park's maintenance staff would be looking at maintaining any enclosure, uh, we do have vandalism throughout the city, not just at Coffee Park as well, so it is unfortunate that that ha does happen sometimes. But it would be a contract service as well as park maintenance, so hope that helps. Any other questions? Are there uh, porta potties in all the other neighborhood parks? The quick answer is no. The longer answer is that it varies between uh, neighborhoods. Some neighborhoods desire them, others don't. We typically do it when there's a sports field or other need, or um, park permits do allow portable restrooms to be used for, on occasion for special occasion. So it's throughout the... Are there any... Are there any other questions about the process and uh, what we're going to be going for forward next time? <laughs> Mine is actually a funding question. I'm just wondering whether or not the city is allowed to apply for the fire, wildfire relief funds to help fund the park for the shortfall. Fire welfare relief no, funds. Wildfire relief. Oh wow, well, wildfire relief funds. I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, potentially, if if it's open for public or government agencies, um, so definitely um, talk to us afterwards. I, I'm always open at looking at any kind of funding source that's available. That would be great. Okay. Any other questions about process or design or anything else? I was wondering if the city is thinking about taking out some of the grass just for um, saving water and that kind of stuff. Not necessarily. So we're going to be looking at replacing what was there, and we're also going to be listening to all of your comments. So if there's a if there's a lot of comments where there's a request to reduce turf, we can look at that. Uh, but generally, we're looking to replace what was there. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tracy Henry. I teach third grade at Schaefer. I've taught there for 23 years, so I feel like even though I don't live in this neighborhood, I know every other person at every other house if I walk down the streets. Oh, you, you, you. So I, I feel a huge part of this neighborhood, and, and the passion in this neighborhood has been unbelievable. So thank you for that. My question, though, has to do with the plans for the park, because wanting our kids to be involved in it, there's a huge project-based learning is an enormous thing right now, and I would love to have what the plans were available to my kids so that they can play with the concept and sometimes little minds come up with pretty amazing things in terms of planning what they would like to see in a park. So um, is that available somewhere that we can get to our kids so that we can let them use their ingenuity to come up with some potential suggestions? Not I bathrooms. Sorry, not bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm going to write that down. We can place the plan on the online, the srcity.org coffee project. We can place that plan that was available so that you can use it for the students as a okay. way to let That's their create, creativity And we can out. have access to that even though I'm not a resident of the neighborhood? Yes. Okay. Any other questions about the process or next steps or anything? 
Looks like we're winding down. So just as a reminder, please fill out the survey. Do meet with your neighbors in the next room. The surveys are here in this room at the back of the room. You can take as many as you need to take to other adults or friends who couldn't make it today and um, fill them out before you leave if you can and drop them in this box uh, or mail them back to us or if you uh, find time online to do it, you can do it on there as well. Uh, any last questions before we wrap it up? I just uh, wanted to know if you guys, as the city of Santa Rosa, would allow private entities to come in and help with the debris removal that stays on the corner of Dogwood and Mocha. Um, the one I have to drive by every day helps all of us remind ourselves of what happened. I have the facilities and also the manpower to help remove it. So if we can come to terms with when that could be possible, I'd like to get a plan of action set in motion and remove it as soon as possible. We, we will def I'll talk to you afterwards, but uh, just by way of knowing that we are a government agency, we are subject to the public contract code, which means a bidding process and things like that, labor unions, et cetera. So we do, we just have to be careful as we move forward, but I am open to any option, so we'll, we'll chat afterwards. Any last questions? Um, just because I don't, I know everyone's not had the discussions with the public art people like Coffee Strong has. Would it be possible when you go to the website to list the examples of each kind of art? Because if they go and they say, "Oh, this is functional art," if you could like have a picture of not even from Santa Rosa but anywhere else of like this is what functional art is and the type of thing that we could put in there, so people have a frame of reference for what they would like to choose. Is that possible? I think we could work something out like that. My only hesitation, and I think we can be general enough, is I don't want to preclude any other ideas. So when you show people pictures of possible projects, it can kind of limit that that's what they think they have to have in that park or for the project. However, I think that we could come up with some examples of those different types of work that are broad enough to not focus people uh, when they're looking at images. That's why I didn't include any images today. I just wanted to keep it about the process. So. Thanks, Tara. Any last questions? Okay, thank you all very much. I appreciate your time and energy and effort so much. Fill out the survey and uh, let all your neighbors know srcity.org. Thank you. Thank you.